<laughs> hey everyone, being an adventurer is tough. Sometimes you just need a bit of help, ain't that right, Ian? Mm -hmm. There are many benefactors out there who seek to fund adventurers for their own gains. But what happens when the one filling your coin purse is also the villain? Find out on today's episode of Crit Academy as we discuss Benavads. Hello and welcome, heroes, to the Crit Academy. I am your host, Justin. And I'm your co-host, Ian. Brandon's... Something. Running behind. <laughs> Dulcina's like, where's Brandon? Well, he took he drank a potion of invisibility, and we cast silence on it. <laughs> <laughs> nothing about how you look at the magic. I am hard for the invisible cloak. There's nothing on it. <laughs> <laughs> what is this magic item? I don't know. It doesn't say anything. All right. We hope to inspire you with creative content that you can bring with you on your next adventure. I am super excited for today's main topic because part of what makes uh, a, a story in Dungeons & Dragons interesting is how all the characters can mesh, whether they're the NPCs or the PCs. And finding a good way to drive those and tie them all together is a key um, feature of um, a good story. So the most common thing that we see is adventurers accepting work from somebody, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you could argue that these, you know, are called benefactors. And, you know, they do all come in all shapes and sizes. And, you know, everyone can use a helping hand once in a while. Sometimes, however, those relation relationships with patrons, employers, or other benefactors can come, become strained or even worse. So today we're talking Benabads by Alan Tucker. And what's really cool about this is inside it, it details entities who offer benefits to the party of adventures in the short or long term, but who can also transform into formidable villains, providing conflict, intrigue, and excitement for any type of campaign, which I just think is super exciting. Um, Ian, you got a, a chance to browse through this. What was your first off the cuff, uh, thoughts on this product? I mostly focused more on the first entry, which is but, that the one we're covering or was that the other one? I don't know. There's two of them. I know, but oh, okay. I thought you basically had a very layered character here. It could even get where they're coming from, which mm -hmm. I think always makes a good villain too. Absolutely. And... I always think it's a good thing where you can see why, why in their mind, they're the hero. You can even see their argument behind that. You can mm -hmm. even see how outside forces around them had the best of intentions, yeah. but that may not have the results they desired. Yeah. And I think, uh, the so we're going to actually show you some of this. There's a few different things that... Um, uh, Alan did with this and he actually did something really, really cool. Um, he created what's called a living document for Benabads, um, meaning that more content will be added as time goes on approximately every six to eight weeks, at least six, uh, at least six times until the end of the year, he'll be adding new fully fleshed out Benabads to the book, increasing the price accordingly. However, everyone who's already purchased it gets all those Benabads at no additional cost. So make sure you jump in early on this deal. And it's worth noting too, that they put in a lot. For yes. Each entry. Yeah. So um, the first entry uh, comes in with uh, only two Benabads, but they, but they are very well fleshed out. So why don't we pop over and, and show this bad boy? Let's see if we can get it open here uh, onto the, take out our full screen here. So, here you can see we got the the Benabad. They got the 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 nice cover art. I love the the the, the filigree that's going with this because this totally screams I'm a hero, which honestly does fit the character. Yes, absolutely. Um, so benefactors who become your worst enemies is 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 a great introduction to this. As I said, um, written by Alan Tucker. He's a good friend of ours. Um, he didn't send us this or anything to to promote it. It just was. This is awesome. We got to talk about it. So. Uh, we kind of already discussed the different ones, but this comes with two different Benabads. We're only going to be discussing one, uh, Lady Ronin Dearborn, because as he, uh, Ian already said, there's a lot of content for each of these. Um, each one is broken down into a few different segments. Um, Ian, do you want to tell us the different segments that it's broken down into? Well, first off, you get the history of the character. Yep. And which also like not only dives into who they are and why they believe what they do, but their equipment, 
perks and so forth. Mm -hmm. We got their associates, other persons of interest, some quests that can come off this person. Why this person may turn on you. The estate, which includes maps and some magic items. Yes. So, like I said, there's only there's two in this right now. Um, it's uh, available for only uh, a, a few bucks, uh, Alicia. If you could get the the price dropped on the the stream for us, so everyone can see what it is right now. Remember, it's going to be getting a constant update, um, and you'll be getting additional benabads for no cost. Um, it currently is going for three ninety five. So, um, drop in now, and you're going to get six. Uh, Six up new update at least every six or eight weeks, which is awesome. So let's move on through this. Hey, Brandon, what's up, B? You okay? We're screaming. Is everything okay? Deep breaths. Everything's fine. Is it? He said, bring a sweater. So I turned my happy ass around and brought a sweater. Oh, well, oh, that, okay. that's fine. That's <laughs> All right. Been, you just been fine. All right. Oh, so okay. let's talk about Lady uh, Ronwyn Dearborn. So that's fine. Explain a few things in chat. Right, right. <laughs> um, so here you can see uh, Ronin. Is it Ronin? It might be Ronin. Oh, Ronwyn. Ronwyn? Ronwyn. 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 Comes from a long line of warriors for Torm, and the family was granted lesser noble status during the time of Ron Wynn's grandparents. Both her parents, Oral and Augusta, were proud and righteous paladins who perished battling a demonic incursion when Ron Wynn was 15. She continued in her parents' footsteps and trained in the church until she was old enough to take over the family estate. Um, so this, just this one paragraph, and there's many here to go, uh, obviously we can't cover it all, but, um, that gives you a really good kind of concept and idea of where Ron went, sorry, <laughs> and, where... you dis- and you discover later in the document, there's way more to it. Than oh, that. there's so mm-hmm. much more. And I think it's little things like that, that make the Benabads interesting because that you'll see that theme kind of coming back up and down. Uh, more than once during the, the the thing. I wonder if we can, can we do this side by side? No, it won't let us. Okay. Um, yeah, there it goes. If I shrink it. So, nope, can't get the other guys in there. Sorry. Me. We'll go back to the way it was. All right. So um, here we got, uh, we talked about the description and history at, uh, already. Um, as you can see, there's a lot more to it. Uh, let's talk about some of the other little details that they get. Each Benabad has a secret agenda. Brandon, would you like to tell us what the secret agenda for uh, Ronwin? For Ronwin Dearborn. Uh, uh, over the past couple of years, Ronwin has grown increasingly suspicious of leadership in the church and local government, which I like the way this is going because, you know, that, that, that could lead to a whole, whole bunch Especially of... Especially since she's a paladin. She's, yeah, she's a paladin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, See, uh, she believes they may be under a sinister influence and seeks any shred of evidence to support her theory. Their continued refusal to ask for her aid regarding threats which require uh, smiting smiting (laughs) only adds fuel to this fire, cutting her judgment further each day. So just in these two paragraphs, we have a really good idea of the type of character Lady Ronwyn is. Mm -hmm. Not just as an ally, but as a potential villain, right? Especially if maybe one of these churches, your group has a cleric that uh, abides by one, right? You're immediately creating a sort of uh, uh, conflict. Um, And the other thing I really liked is we get a lot of monsters and stuff, but very rarely are they delivered wearing or carrying magical items. Yep. Do you want to talk about the special equipment that they gave, uh, uh, that Alan gave Lady Ronwyn? Well, by default, she wears plus two plate mail and a plus one short sword. However, they do include some other magic <laughs> items, which can beef her up pretty good, including the armor purpose. Which is really cool. And uh, might have some ace edge to it that may not be obvious at first. <laughs> yeah. Turn up right. It's like, here we go. I got that. All right. So... Um, so we're going to talk about the magic items in, uh, in our UTT segment. So, and part of her distrust does come from the fact that she actually was very dedicated to cause, Mm -hmm. but some of the leadership who had the best intentions in mind, so it's like, she might be a little bit too dedicated. Let's, uh, listen to her do a little bit to take the pressure off her. Right. Right. And And then her reaction was, why are they giving me less work? (laughs) And, and, and that, that's something that some people could really find uh, a, a common, thread right something that wow i had all this work and they're taking away from me what did i do something wrong or something what's going on right yep. 
Um, now, one of the other things in this first page is they are our group patron perks, right? Yep. Um, and that's been around. Which book introduced the group patrons? You remember which one that was? Uh, I can't remember. I don't think it was Anathar's, was it? No. I been Tasha's. I don't know. Anyway, so we got benefits for uh, group patrons. So with Ronwin Dearborn as your group's paper, patron, you gain the following perks. Uh, Brandon, you want to tell us about one? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, one of them is the armory. You can requisition the use of mundane weapons and armor. Although if they are damaged or lost, the cost to repair mm -hmm. or replace nice. them will be Gosh. deducted from your salary. <laughs> That's crap because they usually get damaged anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, so that's one of the perks. Um, uh, and uh, it just been confirmed that it came from the group patrons was from Tasha's. Yeah. Um, Ian, do you want to tell us one more? Well, you can also get some uh, training, which you can like uh, that one. receive most martial disciplines in, and they also encourage you to read the downtime material in both the PHP as well as Sansars. Yes. So that's which something... most people forget exists. Yeah. So that's <laughs> something we don't see a lot in D&D games is um, there are rules to allow players to train in certain features and unlock those skills um, for their characters. And so following a, such a, uh, uh, a well-pronounced, you know, patron, this certainly uh, fits that. Of course, you get room and board and salary and renown, which is one of my personal favorites. But what else is really cool is not only do you get the Ben of Bad, but you get some people that are closely tight knit and involved with them, which I think is uh, pretty cool. Um, Brandon, do you want to tell us about one of these Ben of Bad or one of these associates? One of the associates we got here is a uh, Zach Barr, Ronald Ro Ronald Knopf, <laughs> Ronald <laughs> Ronald Knopf. Uh, he is a Green Dragonborn Warrior of Torm. Use the champion stat block. Uh, VGTM. Uh, Volo's Guide to Monsters, I believe. Yes. I'm going to blow that up and see if it looks better. There we go. It's easier to read. In his early 30s, uh, who fought beside Ronwyn in more than one campaign for the church, uh, she saved his life during a battle with a number of Ooh. bearded devils, and he pledged his service to her from that point forward. He is less zealous and mistrustful of the church than Ro Ronwyn, uh, but knows her faith and Torn is unwavering. Faith in Torn. Faith, faith, faith in Torn. So this is really cool because it ties to a couple different things. Once again, it it, it talks about her following of Torm, uh, and her mistrust of the church. Now, the interesting thing with paladins is their powers aren't um their powers aren't derived from their deities. Um, I could see a change for this of uh tying her oaths to following the the church and then breaking those oaths potentially and becoming a venge vengeance paladin right mm -hmm. um which i just think is really cool and of course we have more uh us another associate uh nr kesselock i think this was a nice uh kind of inclusion what do you think ian it was a nice touch and as i said before it does help flesh the character more and it helps springboard potential adventures that DMs can use. And I think that's what really makes a, a great supplement when it comes to D&D to, to &D, is having a supplement that can easily be incorporated into any setting. Um, there is a little DM note here about uh, modifying uh, Ron Wynn to fit any uh, uh, oath, um, especially if it's an Aberon, for example, she would likely be a Knight of the Silver Flame. Um, so there's some really good stuff there. As you can see, we've got even more uh, associates to that, that, and each one has their own different tyings and trainings. Like I think, uh, Gon Brighthammer was her trainer, if I remember right. Um, so, uh, you can tell now that we kind of have the circle of people she can rely on and can kind of advise her. And maybe that starts to build up a bit of tension too, which is really fun. Uh, we got a question here from, uh, Garwin says breaking her oath would actually make her an oath breaker. What did I say? Vengeance? Yes, I knew that. I swear I knew that. Thank you, Garwin, for pointing out my dummy. <laughs> Can I just say the artwork is really nice in this uh, platform or in this the supplement too. Um, they're all really fit well together, and I like the little um, the the style a lot. So uh, now we want to talk a little bit about quests. The quests. What's up? Oh, it's a user on uh, TikTok saying Ebron was expanded in uh, Tasha's. Yep. Uh, so here we have quests. Now you can see the quests are just a few one-liners. Um, they're very short description hooks, but I think they're really good. 
Um, Brandon, do you want to uh, pick one out and talk about it? Livestock has gone missing recently from a number of farms in the area, and the farmers have beseeched Ronwin for help. The cause could be a wild animal, poachers, or something more sinister, such as a wooden leg. What? Such Did you just make that up? <laughs> yes, yes, such as a wooden leg a and, wooden the, and the Ferrando Cube. Oh, oh God. Cow level. <laughs> cow level, I got you. Um, so <laughs> what I think is really cool about this, because you don't see this very often, um, the players <laughs> usually actively go look for jobs, right? Yep. Uh, Ronwin can send her, her minions to re to f locate and find the players and, uh, you know, talk with them directly and say, Hey, Ronwin wants to you to meet her in her war room. She's got some work for you to do. And maybe you make a couple of these bullet points, um, as options. She says, Hey, here's what's going on right now. I think this is most important, but, um, we've got plenty of heroes. Which one interests you? So it gives you a really good way to drive uh, let, drive the story, but still let the players kind of pick and choose what interests them. Uh, specifically, one that I thought was interesting was a terrified peasant comes to Ronwin with an account of the dead rising from an abandoned man monast or, uh, cemetery. This is an opportunity to twist that however you want. It could be zombies. It could be skeletons. <laughs> it could be him going crazy and he's seeing ghosts and they're not actually dead rising. It's just spirits. Or maybe it's meeting of sinister people in the dead of night. You know what I mean? Or maybe it's just a party. <laughs> people <laughs> have a bunch of kids having a party. <laughs> you kids um, drinking? No. <laughs> what else we got here? So um, one of my favorite parts is how the tides can turn. Ronwin can become the party's worst enemy in a couple of ways. Ian, do you want to give us an example? If uh, Gun, her trainer, is involved, Ronwin's feelings of betrayal are intensified. She is convinced the evil has rooted itself in the temple, and nothing by complete cleansing will satisfy Torm's wrath. And what do you think she means by cleansing? Purge. Yeah, that's what I. That's what. That's the way I read that. What about you? Smite. Yeah, for a purge. Yeah, and so. This quickly goes from this follower and uh, trust, trustworthy person to leading a potential uh, massacre, pulling which is really, really great. I'm pulling an Anakin. <laughs> uh, Master Skywalker, what are we to do? I gotta get them young ones. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Brandon, do you want to read one more? Oh, that's fucked up. Uh, let's see. Another way the tides can turn is that the party... Uh, they find Ronwin's methods disconcerting. Uh, after spending some time with her, and can be approached by Kieran Felspar for questioning, or even be asked to act as double agents to investigate Ronwin's activities. If Ronwin finds out about this kind of betrayal, <laughs> heads would fly, and her campaign against the local authorities would be escalated. Oh no! <laughs> I love it. Alan did such a superb job with this. Yeah. It's also worth noting two things. One, she mm -hmm. definitely believes in that might is right and mm -hmm. has no problem uh, using excessive force. And two, despite the fact that she is actively trying to supplant the local authorities, the general townsfolk actually kind of like her for it because she actually seems to be getting work done. And you know what? There's some good in that, right? Because mm -hmm. there tends to be uh, issues where um stuff gets stagnated in paperwork yep and she's just like this is stupid why are we waiting garwin says to betray the very thing you hold so dear to betray your innermost ideology for an easier path <laughs> i like that um so this is really cool now let's talk about uh, uh her stat block as a whole um because i think that that's something that uh is really really well done you can tell he's took the most recent uh design path um for uh that's coming out in the Monsters of the Multiverse, which we'll be talking about next week. So, yep. so, so <laughs> come and, and watch us. Uh, <laughs> so, Lady Ronwen Dearborn uh, is a CR twelve, so she's potent. Um, so, this is, uh, I mean, this is somebody you can totally start the characters underneath her at like level one, mm -hmm. and as they progress, she gets progressively worse. Or maybe they don't notice the things, and as stronger as they get stronger and more reliable. Maybe then she starts to, they start to notice things because they get more involved in the work that she's doing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. So that I do sense. like the layout. Um, as I've said, this definitely is, seems to take the newer style where there's not necessarily a spell list, just mechanics. 
Uh, and you can see she gets aura, aura of Courage, which I think is great if she's the villain. <laughs> um, she's going to get Aura of Protection. So do they get both? Yeah. That's awesome. She's got a protection, a courage protection auras. That's awesome. She gets divine health, which means she's immune to diseases. And of course, what paladin be complete without? Smite. Smite these bitches. Ow. You okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, we also get lay on hands. Leadership is a nice touch. And of course, she gets turn on holy and parry. So she's pretty straightforward when it comes to mechanics. Um, but I think that this would make for an interesting uh, boss battle if necessary. I really think a great way to showcase her power would to have her show up and rescue the day when the player characters are in trouble. Yeah. Or maybe she overestimated their power and they're getting their butt kicks and she shows up and they're instantly revitalized with their courage and they can feel their, their her aura radiating and, and kind of surrounding them like a blanket. Which is so much fun. I love it. Um, what I do like, so check out this map, you guys. Uh, if you haven't seen the Dungeon Alchemist Kickstarter... This is one of the maps from that. Uh, I, this was for the beta users at the moment, and it's so pretty. I love it. It looks gorgeous. It's so nice. Uh, so kudos for the. the so that's the Dearborn Estate. Each each uh, each uh, Benabad has their little lair maps here. So you already got a place for the players to hang out, which is really cool. This little training yard here, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Actually, it says got numbers on it, so it looks like he gives us details on each room uh, the and what they Estate, are. The entry hall. Yeah. So this is really cool. Like I said, it looks really nice. What are your guys' thoughts? It looks beautiful. Yeah, it does. I it's love very, the style. It's very 3D. For, yeah, for those who actually cannot see what we're talking about. Uh, it's not just a standard overview 2D model. It's everything is in the third dimension. Yeah. And it's really pretty. Yeah. You, I, I not like quite it. isometric. But. Yeah. I bet it could be, though. Uh. All right, so we got some really good stuff. You even got crypts here, ballrooms, study lounge. You got there's a lavatory. So if Isn't you don't know, yes. yes. If you don't know, the best lavatory ever was in a book, a book that Jeff Stevens uh, made, oh where it was in a wizard's lab, a wizard's tower, and the toilet was a bag of holding, and then the players dumped it out, <clears> and <throat> shit spilled up several floors on the toilet. <laughs> All right, so once again, right. not only do we get great story, great backstory, great character arcs, a quest hooks, we also get uh, a nice location, too. Oh, hey, Carl, make sure to get behind your ears. <laughs> What's he doing? Get them uh, soapy suds going all over that body. You want to make yourself squeaky clean. He's taking a shower. <laughs> what are you talking about? He's looked down the list. He's taking a shower. He said he would still be listening, so no, whisper sweet, nothing's in your ear. Make sure you clean that beard. Get that get that mustache a nice curl for me. <laughs> Don't be asking for pictures on the internet. Send those privately. Uh, all right, so let's continue. Uh, there's some really cool magic items. We're gonna talk about those in the UTT. Currently, as I said, Benabads is going to be a living document. It currently has two um Benabads in it. Uh Therian, Wildheart is the next one, which is awesome. Artwork, by the way. I love it. Um, and once again, you get the same kind of material delivered. You pick it up now, you're going to get every additional add-on that he adds over the next year, which should be at least six, I think he said. Or at least six. Was it six or six weeks? I don't remember. At least six. Uh, so I think that that's really cool. Um, and I recommend picking it out if this sounds interesting to you. Because six to eight weeks, and at least at least six times until twenty end of twenty twenty two. Right, right. So now remember, the sooner you buy it, the cheaper it is. Yeah. So if you pick it up right now at three ninety five, you're gonna get um six at least six updates into this. And now I can tell you, I've already seen the preview for the next update, and I'm pretty sure it has three Benabads in it. All right. So the first update is already more content than is in this one. So and they are juicy. I love it. Do you guys got any other uh, um, details on uh, this product before we uh, move on? I think it's a really neat idea to be able to gain this ally in any kind of camping you're doing, whether it's in a book mm -hmm. or if it's a homebrew. And then you can just take this ally you once had and just flip them right around and be like, nope, they're not your friend no more. And those are the best kind of twists in your story right especially if you think she's level 12 and you start at level one and you make it all the way to level 10 before you start to realize shit she's the villain but what if the players decide to side with her and help with the bird oh gosh 
<laughs> they're relatable. That's why they yep. can be relatable. So I definitely recommend checking it out. And if you do check it out, make sure to use the affiliate link because we get a small kickback. I don't know where she's posted that, but it's here somewhere. Uh, you can find it in the description on the YouTube or, or in the, the chat here. Um, so, all right. I think that'll do it for our um, main topic today, Benabads. <laughs> um, so before we move on to our honor tips and tricks, we just had our third clash of classes, you guys. <laughs> that, that was great. It was I, so much fun. I, I just at moment like, oh, this is gonna kill the guy. The guy. <laughs> yes, that's what? okay. Uh, kill what? Who? The smite. Was it a smite? No, it was just a chain whip from the. Oh Cooper. yeah. So so <laughs> if you guys don't know, in clash of classes, uh, we drop two players into arena, and there's hazards in Clash of Classes three. There was two ogres on chains on the ends of so, the out so uh, the wait, arena. Someone won because of a hazard. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you were there. I, thought, I totally I forgot too. I'm gonna be honest. Final hit from a no player. Uh, no. It was. It came in from the. So the the two <laughs> ogres, their chains slowly got longer until they were fighting right next to one that was just swinging a chain or a, was like a ball on a chain or something yeah and just demolished one of them i'm like well it's gonna attack the closest guy and the Here. guy with the way she's the closest guy is that uh, area effect so yeah sorry Good and job. the other player actually swooped around to the other side so we wouldn't get attacked anyways <laughs> it's been a lot of fun <laughs> we totally uh uh narrate as if we're watching you're watching a ww uh smackdown so please consider checking it out there'll be a link in the dibbly do uh how about we go ahead and move to honor tips and tricks yeah honor tips and tricks what you're all here and now what you've all been waiting for our unearth tips and tricks segment where we bring you new and reusable material for both players and dms so cold in here my balls are marbles Oh shit! <laughs> the they can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, would you like to tell us about our character concept today? <laughs> Maya Lee Menethrin, human female, tall, athletic northern woman, wearing silk and lunge about seductively. <laughs> her clothes are kept pristine and fit tightly to her frame. Ooh. Her unique. <laughs> Dark green hair is covered with dye made from the plant oil to accent her emerald eyes. Oh. Her eyes reveal really passion and liveliness under the seduction. God damn. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, do, you need, do you need a moment? Uh, personality, ha. Huh? <laughs> need a moment? Oh. <laughs> that wasn't my hand. <laughs> Miali is the type to enjoy getting a rise out of people. <laughs> Giggle. <laughs> She believes, it, that, she believes that the primal urges all creatures feel is the most effective way to control and manipulate them. Her seductiveness hides her more controlling nature. Uh, she will make even kings beg for her attention like a dog. While at the same time, beating them down with both words and fists. Oh no. Who's no. a bad dog? <laughs> In her history, her home was attacked by brutal bandits. They slayed any and all that they could find. With the help of her parents, she was able to hide until the attack was over and her village was burned or, uh, burned around her. Taken in by a madam, she was trained in the arts of pleasure and intrigue. Oh. <laughs> Motivation? She seeks to build a business out of information exchange, becoming an info broker of the highest quality. Ooh. Doing so will require her to travel, build up followers, heh, and pass on the skills she learned to squeeze information out of any who can fall under her lusty spell. What do you guys think? Well, I know what Brandon thinks. Uh, the table is rising from that end. <laughs> I got to tell you, though, uh, if you want to get information about people in a game like this, this is the kind of character to be using. Yeah. Um, so I, I cannot tell a lie. This is certainly inspired by one of the characters that I am writing for an upcoming project, and I'm ex I can't wait for it to it come out. So it's keep an eye out. Project, ooh, you naughty boy. <laughs> C O M, dude. Nah. What? <laughs> I'm coming. Oh, oh my god! I thought that's what you were getting at. Our show may not be suitable for young children, but neither is our D and D table. 
All right. I and think... the Manscaped ads will like, cross the line for some people. <laughs> Manscaped. <laughs> oh, uh, God, I want to make sure you're manscaping pretty well now. <laughs> <laughs> he's still in the shower. <laughs> Do you think it's grown out like his beard? <laughs> TM. Uh, all right. So I let's move on. To... <laughs> if he just like it throws it down and he's got like some curly hairs like his mustache. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the, the hilt on a sword. <laughs> Back on top. That's Sorry, dude. All right. Disturbing, but would still be pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie. All right. Let's talk. Uh, that'll do it for our character concept. Uh, Mia Lee Manetherin. I was expecting Ian to say something about that, but he didn't. <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right. So uh, our monster variant is the Arc Forge Sentry. Oh my God. The artwork for this is awesome. Uh, so if you like it, make sure to, uh, become a patron and get the whole stat block and lore and backstory and all that stuff that comes with it. So, yeah. uh, to build this bad boy, we're going to start with the gargoyle. Oh. Uh, lost features, false appearance. Bite, <laughs> sorry, I got distracted. So, uh, it's going to lose features, false appearance, bites, claws, and fly. Oh no, it's going to lose fly. <laughs> New features. We're going to give it skills, athletics, and perception, and we're going to make it immune to poison and vulnerable to lightning. Oh, yay. Vulnerable. That's important because there's not enough vulnerabilities and weaknesses in Dungeons and Dragons no, monsters. There isn't. No. Condition immunities. Charms, exhaustion, frightened, paralyzed, and poison. <gasps> That's because we're making it a construct. That's now, so, yeah. Is this a... senses, blind sight to 10 feet, dark vision to 60, and passive for 12. Now let's talk about how it's got more than one weakness. Anti-magic susceptibility, which basically means it's incapacitated while in an animal anti-magic field area or if targeted by dispel magic better make that con save you're going down so what is going to make this thing that we've weakened with all these weaknesses make it so badass what the fuck everything else <laughs> everything else <laughs> so um the reason i i want to i wanted to touch on the 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 weaknesses because i think that part of players spending their time investigating the what they're going to be fighting should reveal things like that and should be rewarding and targeting weaknesses and knowing what to avoid is is critical in my opinion so we're going to give it death burst so you got to succeed a dc uh 14 deck save within 10 feet or take 48 lightning damage and a target can't take reactions until the start of its next turn on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one so this thing when it dies blows up and shoots lightning strikes in all directions which is just fun we're going to give it a new weapon called the Arc Blade. <laughs> Guess what that does? It does 1d6 plus 2 slashing damage plus 1d4 lightning damage. That's right. I'll be shot. It's, it's a taser. <laughs> it's a taser. Uh, we're still going to keep the slam, but we're going to give it a, a new... A new uh, well, we're going to give it slam, which requires a DC 14 strength save or be knocked prone. So not only can we sh shock you with lightning, we can literally bitch slap you to the ground. But wait. There's more. We're going to give them Arc Lightning, which recharges on a six. On a six. Uh, the Arc Forge releases a chaotic bolt of lightning that arcs towards a target it can see within 60 feet. Three bolts then leap from that target to as many as up to three targets, each of which must be within 30 feet of the first. A target uh, can be a creature or an object and can be targeted by only one of the bolts. A target must succeed a DC 14 deck save, or it takes 48 lightning damage Can't take re and can't take reactions until the next turn on a failed save, or it takes half as much damage on a successful one. But wait. There's more. We're also going to give it a reaction. Shield counter. When an attack misses the arc forge due to the plus two bonus granted by its shield, it can use its reaction to make a slam attack, knocking your punk ass to the ground. When your players piss you off, just that a little too much. <laughs> Now, in my defense, yes, this is a lot, but we also gave him an opportunity to incapacitate it in entirely, as well as deal double damage to it. Uh -huh. And we yeah. took away fly. So, um, yes, it is a little power on the damage side, but I feel like it's been offset enough by introducing weaknesses. What do you guys think? I think what could make it like, like help is like the arc lightning, mm -hmm. like that ability is not available. Until the players learn that it is vulnerable to lightning, because as they're hitting with lightning, it is slowly charging that ability. But it's supposed to be weak against it. Yes, but then why would it spew electricity? 
Oh, you're talking about it being part of the 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 its weakness. It so it's getting like a short and lightning is just bouncing in all directions. Yeah, they hit him okay. enough, and eventually he just goes. You know what? <laughs> just hits everyone for it. I can see that. That's pretty cool. What do you think, Ian? Yeah, that was one thing that jumped down on me. It's like you don't usually see a creature whose main element it shoots at you is what it's weak against. <laughs> yes, although <laughs> that could be a way to hide its weakness. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was thinking because, well, first of all, I was thinking an electrical uh, scent, uh, like construct, right? Yeah. Something that's powered by arcane energy and lightning kind of dis- disrupts that, right? Because the other thing I was going to do is instead of it being arc lightning, it was going to be like an arc bolt or <laughs> something and do like force damage, but I skipped all that. And I like what you said. I totally planned it to hide its weakness. Because who's going to think the thing throwing lightning at me is weak against it? Not, oh, it's probably immune to it. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, anything else in regards to that? No, sir. No, no I like that. I like that monster. <laughs> give it a big bow. Give it a big bow. Maybe blessed by a patron of the two rivers. Ah, nice. Somebody got it. All right, that'll do it for our monster variant. As I said, if you become a patron, these get full fleshed out artwork, backstories, and character lore checks that you can share the information, such as weaknesses and vulnerabilities, with them. All right. Oh, Brandon, shit. you got a short one today. Would you like to tell us? Encounter some- the Rites of Ascension. Thank you. Let's go to our magic guy. Yeah, you said it was short. (laughs) While the characters wander around a noble's study, or perhaps a warlock's chambers, they stumble across a thick, leather-bound tome that reeks faintly of alchemical mixtures. (sighs) (sighs) Smells good. Yeah. Methane. (laughs) Written along its binding is the title, The Rites of Ascension. (laughs) Ascension. Is this supposed to be chloroform to you? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's way really loud on the mic uh spiderweb like script written in a primitive dialect of abyssal a character who spends a short or long rest reading the book learns that it provides a step-by-step process by which a mortal may form a pact with the purest of evil and transform themselves into a fiend what do you guys think why would we call the right of ascension that they're turning to something <clears throat> Because um, fiends and stuff are considered, they consider themselves superior to everyone. So likely this uh, book okay. was written that makes sense. by a fiend of the abyss that ascended into greatness, I would imagine. I don't know. I didn't think that far ahead. <laughs> so I kind of left this one a little more vague than I normally do. And I want to kind of hear your thoughts where you guys think this would be going. There is definitely... A few routes one could take, and I could easily see if even if you play through, like I can become a fiend, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think this is a. Uh, oh, go ahead. I, I wanted to hear your thoughts before I said what, what, what I was going to advantages, advantages of becoming a fiend? Um. Well, I think they live forever. That would be one. Until they're killed, anyway. <laughs> so immortality. That would be one. Command armies. Of course, you're stuck in the abyss. So who knows? I don't know. It depends. You'd have to ask one of them. I have no idea. So for I, me, maybe like a deal with a devil type of thing. We'll yeah, go. and that's kind of where I was going with this. I thought it would be a good. I think books. Ever since Candle Keep came out, I feel like books should get more um, attention in Dungeons and Dragons. And so finding a book like this not only can appeal to um, the lore character or lore player in your D and D group, but it can also in um, appeal to somebody who's interested in becoming a world a fiend of the uh, pact of the making a pact of the warlock uh, the pact of the fiend warlock yeah. um whether multi-class or just taking it when they get to their third level so something that i don't see uh, a lot of i want to touch on andrew's comment here real quick oh neat idea scroll turrets spell scrolls made in the same way sheets uh for player pianos are made uh, and you can fit a number of scrolls into one and crank the turret to fire off, fire off spells with more range. That's hilarious. Um, I'm not even sure where that conversation is coming from. Uh, a firebolt minigun? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so um, what I was originally uh, trying to get at is that players don't need a reason to delve into a multi-class or a mechanic or anything like that for their game. But I think it's nice to maybe set up the opportunity. If I know Brandon is about to 
or is going to take Fiend Pact to the Warlock or is interested in it, setting something like this up could be an in-game way to actually lead down that direction. You know what I mean? That sounds amazing. You got anything? Not at this time. Okay, well, you're next. So that'll do it. That'll do it for our encounter. Uh, the rights of ascension or descension, I guess, is what uh, uh, <laughs> I saw in chat earlier. Apparently, uh, by Dalcinia. Apparently, I'm not good enough. A lot of chat going on without me by Wheel of Time. I hate you all. Uh, so, Ian, why don't you tell us about our very complex magic item? Oh, shit. Yeah, now, see, I guess a solitude, which is from the bag. And plot twist it is not one item. It is two items. Yeah, like an arm, armor set piece. Yep. Basically, it is the sword singularity in the armor purpose. Each benefits from the random properties table, getting one minor beneficial property. And they also mention that since you can see the world more clearly than others and have the ability to fix problems no one else can see. That's so cool. That reminds me of Tavirin. Yep. Ah, shit just around him happens. Yeah, well. The properties of, of a singular lead long sword. It serves as a plus two long sword of sharpness, and it is a blade with a gleaming silver handle and pommel sporting an intricate emerald and gold filigree. Nice. Purpose, the armor, serves by itself as a plus two plate armor of invulnerability. Damn! Same emerald and gold armor filigree adorns the armor. The properties is when both are worn together... The no emerald and gold become like obsidian, and Singularity's blade looks as though it could swallow all light. Oh, that's cool. And you are convinced you are the only person in the world with the knowledge and the ability to rule anyone who stands in your way <laughs> is a fool. <laughs> the, you also gain one major beneficial property, two minor detrimental properties, and one major detrimental property. That doesn't seem fair. <laughs> Until... In addition, when you wield them together, your strength becomes 20, unless it's already 20 or higher. Any melee attack you make with Singularity deals an extra 3d6 necrotic damage on a hit. And if you are already, say, a paladin who's already smiting, ow. <laughs> and as a bonus action, you can invoke Singularity to reverse gravity as per the spell, but the center of gravity is a sword itself. Oh, <laughs> man, that's cool. Come here. <laughs> I'm going to get you one way or another. Before we get... And you are unaffected. But everything else is drawn to the sword. And it acts as a fear, fear, a fear of annihilation for 10 minutes until you, or until you use a bonus action to cancel the effect. Or incapacitated. Jesus. Yeah. To destroy uh, this thing, both pieces must be completely submerged in holy water while one, well, in one of the planes of the abyss. <laughs> that, where are you going to find holy water in the plane of good, abyss? Good luck. You're going to take it with you. <laughs> <laughs> they then become mundane long swords and plate armor. And there's actually quite a bit of lore to this item, too, that which is covered in Venomance, mm -hmm. but yeah. yeah. We're not going to get into that. No. The reason I included this because I like that it just says one major beneficial property. Because that means what? You can determine it randomly, or the DM can specifically pick it. Or roll, yeah. Yeah, I like the idea of random rolling and making the item have a different property at every campaign that it's used in. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. um, and that's a set of details that doesn't get used in most uh, magic items that I don't think I've seen any of them do that. Have you? Not too often. So, um, obviously, this is a very powerful item or items. Um, and I like that part of it is this is something I is this something she's wielding? I don't remember. Is Ron she wields the armor. Yes. When you read into the, to the uh, lore, her mom wore the armor where her father wielded the sword and her the sword's buried with her father. Yeah. Okay. Although I, if you although one thing that's not covered in here is if you put on the armor and you fail a fist a saving throw, you then feel compelled to find the find sword. The sword. So that right there is an amazing campaign hook, right? Yep. Um and I just that just seemed this is a really fun item. Obviously it's very powerful. Um, they are definitely artifact level items, but they're game changing. And these are what entire campaigns are built around. So well, that could start with Ron, Ron, Ronwin, Ronwin. Yeah. Ronwin. You get up to that level 10 and then you finally get that interaction where you got a fighter. And when you finally do offer, you got that armor and someone puts it on and now you got to go and find that sword. Yeah. I like it. I like it. I thought it was awesome. I think Alan did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. That is the Aegis of Solitude, a two-piece set 
magic item, which I think is awesome. And we need more of that. Plus two long solutions. So, all right. That'll do it for our magic item, the Aegis of Solitude. Uh, our magic item of the podcast. We just did that. I'm sorry. Our Dungeon Master tip for the podcast. A world of books. Hey. In a world of fantasy, books are one of the primary ways information is stored and passed on. In D&D, books represent doorways into politics, creatures, lands, and even fanciful entertainment of the world. They can even entice the imagination and delight the senses. Ooh. <laughs> we can and should be doing more than just dungeon dressing. So, when your characters stumble into a library, a dusty study, or a bookshelf of a villainous noble's chamber and find a volume, they are likely to just not care or overlook it. Simply providing a name to the book can toss the player and the player character into a quick world of imagination. <laughs> Actually, you remember that one uh, text message I sent you guys the other week from uh, Discworld? Yes. Which was a list of names, names. of magic books. Yep. So that's a, so hmm. that's a good source. So you could even probably link that uh, uh, the uh, or drop that on the uh, the Facebook page. Yeah. So uh, this is a great way to short share bits and pieces of the world around them without needing great detail. Uh, a simple title is really all it takes, as Ian just pointed out. Um, just the act of giving it a title to a book will spur the character to spend a few moments skimming through it and gain an understanding of its content. Let's give you an example. A book, uh, a book titled Cholt Cuisine. What do you think in it is in it? Fish. Dinosaur meat. Food. Something. It makes Just it pretty food. obvious, right? It instantly starts Dinos spurring the, the imagination. <laughs> I like the dinosaur meat one. That, that. But Probably basically, spicy. you know, meals from Cholt. A character who spends a few minutes browsing might learn of a delicacy known as Chol Claws. Uh, a character who is interested in this might go then ask about them when they're in that direction or whatever. Who knows? Um, while these aren't going to hook every player, they the characters and players who love the lore and exploration pillars will gobble them up. And if you choose to pick them up and if they choose to pick them up, um, maybe they can seek out a particular buyer that can earn them a little bit of extra gold for taking interest in, um, interest in the book. Or if they're interested, somebody that might be interested in the cuisine in this example, um, a merchant uh, character may be able to price the book at three gold pieces at most shops, but if they find a chef looking to purchase that particular book, they may be able to get more than triple it. In either case, consider giving your books in your dungeon dressing names and that can be used to flesh out uh, characters and locations and events and knowledge of the world. What do you guys think about this? I did this in my homebrew campaign. You did. Yes. It should have told me. I ought to let you read that. <laughs> funny. Let's hear about it. Um, the Warlock, what, really big into uh, going to libraries and reading stuff. Mm -hmm. So every once in a while, I'll be like, okay, what are you trying to look for? It's like, I want to learn more about the cathedral across the street. It's like, okay. So I'll tell them a bunch of little, little histories here and there. But while they were in a dungeon, uh, specifically like the third or second floor of the uh, dungeon underneath the yawning portal. Mm -hmm. So, all right, you found a book called How to Be a Better Adventurer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it, was a, it was a self help book. That's awesome. I also, for the record, I just bought that, that, that document. <laughs> oh, nice. And uh, the way I ended up using this book was anytime he told me that he was going to spend some time reading it, I would uh, give him a hint as to how not to fail on a specific role that's going to be coming up that he doesn't know about. Oh, it's that's like that. awesome. Like, I ran them through the haunt. First thing they did when they found that that uh, the cloaker, mm -hmm. he ran up and just grabbed it because he, he knew what to do. No, he ran up. He walked up to the cloak and grabbed it. This was before they got the book. Oh, okay, okay. He didn't know it was a cloaker. And it was like, well, that's why he almost died. <laughs> so it's little tidbits like that. And it was like, oh, if you see a, a a chest, it might not be a chest or type of thing. Could be dangerous. Yeah, maybe a book on like mimics and stuff is what you're getting at. Um, and, and that's why I think stuff like this is really cool. And it, once again, it can feed into ways to expand your lore without lore dumping on your players. You know what I mean? Um, and that a mimic. That's how one of my players lost 10,000 gold. <laughs> they found a baby mimic. 
and it was hopping around, jumping around. Like, oh, he reaches into his little gold pouch, pulls out a coin, says, here you go, buddy. I did a perception check for the uh, mimic, and it noticed it pulled a coin from that pouch. It jumped up, snagged his pouch, and went into a hole. <laughs> oh, no, and he couldn't get it back? I, I gave him a chance to do a, a deck save to jump for him, and he failed. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but... uh. Honestly, you got two one gold right now. I'm, I'm taking it away. I didn't say it, I didn't say it to him. But <laughs> that's what's going through your mind, though. He'll, that's he'll, funny. He can make up fast enough. All right. I think that'll do it for our <laughs> Dungeon Master tip. Uh, world of Books. World of Books. And our encounter was a book for that very reason. That wasn't a coincidence. That's why I said I was at, it was so short because I wanted to hear what you guys, ideas you guys had. Um, all right. So moving on to our player tip of the podcast. Don't, Don't be, be a, a dick. dick. God damn it. Damn it, Ian. <laughs> that's okay. He's he's busy chatting along with the, the audience. Yeah, with the, yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, let us talk about a hero and their steed. The fine steed second level spell allows a character to summon a spirit that issues the form of an unusually intelligent, strong, and loyal steed, creating a long-lasting bond with it. The steed takes the form of the character's choice, a warhorse, a pony, a camel, etc. <laughs> Name Joe. The steed serves in combat as a mount. Oh, and also, it can understand a language you speak and can te- and can telepathically for one mile. Uh, this is fantastic, but there is more we can do that for some reason is often overlooked. So, while mounted, you can make any spell cast uh cast that only targets you also target your steed yep this is huge <laughs> are you and your steed hurting cure wounds simultaneously yep so you can use one spell for the two entities yes yeah cursed for uh concerned for a tough battle death ward to both your pet <laughs> or to your mount and yourself yep <clears throat> now yeah, this is on the Helen spell list, but obviously there's ways around it. Um, yep. And other spells that you can uh, cast on your mount. This guy, self. You can make the two of you look like flaming skeletal riders and terrify those around you. <laughs> That's a flaming chicken. A flaming chicken. <laughs> flaming chicken. <laughs> uh, you can also use enhance ability, and that'll grant you and your steed temporary hit points, advantage on strength checks, and so much more. How about water breathing? Instantly get yourself a... Seahorse, that's right. Pretty much allowing you to that just sounds awesome, like gr- turning it in, anyways. But my personal favorite is mirror image. You just created a small galloping contingent heading towards somebody, like ish. that's awesome. Ish. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's <laughs> multiple images of you, but the point is the possibilities are endless. If whether you're a lore bard or if you multi class, if you pick up this spell, I promise. It will be amazing. If you just wanted the spell, would you only need one level into Paladin? No, you would. Ha- I think you have to get up to a level in that class to be able to cast it to get it right. I think that's how that works. I think you have to. You can only access spells to the level you're on. But the lore bard can pull spells from any list, so um, they're the easiest oh. way to get that. But multi-classing is certainly one way to do it as well. <laughs> Carwin, he goes. Uh, <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I am imagining a paladin trying to ride a normal, in real life, world size seahorse. What the hell? <laughs> Those things are like the size of your pinky, aren't they? That's pretty uh, cool. All right. So, uh, this is a pretty straightforward optimization thing and benefits. Um, obviously, there's a lot the paladin can do, but I feel like this really shines if you mix it with like a lore bard or get access to it some other way. So, I think that'll do it for our player tip of the podcast. Don't, Don't be, be a, a dick. dick. And you can avoid dicktude by. Using, using a steed. hero and their steed. Whoo, that was a good and chilly episode. Um, now before we close out, we always have a wonderful gift to give away. Um, today's for our RPG Fat Loot giveaway is Benabard's compliments of Alan Tucker. Woo! So, who is our winner today, B? Our winner today is Crazy Daves. Woo! That's Yay! Crazy, crazy underscore Daves. Just in case you are crazy Daves with the underscore, it's not, not, not you. It's crazy <laughs> underscore Daves. So, Brandon, <laughs> if they didn't win, how can they enter and get a chance to win? win? 
well, that's just too bad. But you always have a chance, <laughs> and there's no problem with that. All you got to do is head to CreditAcademy.com and subscribe for your chance to win. It's not just CreditAcademy.com, right? It, it's if you subscribe to YouTube and Facebook and stuff. You, there's a newsletter sign up. There's a newsletter sign up. Just yeah. go to CreditAcademy.com if you want some free Give shit. us your soul. Plus, every Don't time you sign up. Plus, plus, when you sign up, you get a free copy of our challenge accepted, <gasps> plus a link of some of my our favorite uh, uh, free resources. Isn't so. the challenge accepted like a super high selling thing now? It's one of our top yeah, sellers. Yes. Elect, yep. Electum. I, I can't remember the. Uh, I still sell a bunch, yeah. even though I send people to a place where they can get it for free. Yeah. Or you can just buy it right now for four bucks. Plus, a little cheap. Yeah, it's not, it's not expensive at all. But anyways, yeah, it's give, me money, um, give me money, give me money, give me money. And if they want to enjoy us, uh, if they enjoy our show, what can they do to help they us? Want to enjoy us? Well, mm. <laughs> listen to us in the shower. <laughs> yeah. So it's same. Not the first time somebody says something like that. Uh, <laughs> well, obviously, if you want to support us, you can visit us at CraigHenry.com. You can follow us on social media, and also please leave us a review. Mm. Well, finger looking. Oh, apparently I said Benabards. It's Benabads, Benabads. for anyone. Benabards. Uh, I'm being I'm being corrected by the wife. Um, yeah. So <laughs> please do that stuff. Please can follow us and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, we are focusing our content push there. Um, it is uh, where all of our events go down and all that jazz. Um, make sure to come and check out Clash of Classes. I promise this. It's so much fun. Like who could who could have known, right? <laughs> I did not expect the last one to end the way it did, for sure. <laughs> By the way, Brandon, made sure to wash my mustache extra well just for you. Yeah, good, awesome. <laughs> well, I think that'll do it. If you enjoy, uh, if you do pick up the Benabads, um, please leave a review. Um, one of the best things you can do for a content creator is leave a review telling people how much you like it or what are some of your concerns so we can improve our products. Uh, though I don't, I imagine based on what I've seen from Alan, he doesn't make no mistakes, but I know I do. Oh, and uh, also in the same vein too, not just leaving a review for a podcast, but if you bought ever products, yes, leave a review for those too. Yes, please do. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop a plug too because I just have at it. it. Yeah, I also, told you you could uh, on Start Playing Dot Games forward slash DM Gray. That's me. Uh, I have a game this upcoming Wednesday. It is a one shot, and it is a nautical dungeon crawl. It's nothing but fighting. So if you like, go fighting, sign up. Go sign up. It's fifteen dollars per seat. Go do it. Do just, it now. Just fighting, huh? Just, just nothing wrong with that. Uh, you're on a ship. You have I love to it. survive the night. <laughs> he is like, I'm up. <laughs> you're one. You're one day away from water deep, and you got to get there. Just survive one night. So Except you you're do. not going to make it that easy. No. <laughs> Please do. Uh, Felicia wants to drop a, a link for that for him. That would be great. I also do a uh, uh, was it Dragon Heist every other every Friday. Two different groups. Okay. No, no one has signed up for that one yet. So I also just picked the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. So I might be adding that too soon. Um, Andrew is asking a really great question. Didn't Spotify just roll out reviews for podcasts? Yes, yes, they, yes. yes they did. So if you're listening on Spotify right now, stop and well finish the episode, then leave a review. <laughs> Don't don't stop listening to us. Unless you're driving, don't do that. Yeah, don't yeah, don't <laughs> do that. That's bad. All right, with that, let us close out. I'm your host, Justin. I'm your co-host, Ian. And I'm your co-host, Brandon. You ready? Thanks Keep for your, listening. No, ready? Keep Take your, your blades blade sharp and spells, spells prepared, prepared heroes. heroes. Sorry, I forgot about your part. Thanks for listening. We'll see you guys later. Bye. <laughs>